And so the topic of today was acting out as a form of communication. And I'm not sure what you exactly expect when you see kind of one title for a lecture, but let's open it straight up to you. If we're looking at horses, and we're looking at horses acting out, and so many times people will say, my horse is bucking, or my horse is running over the top of me, my horse doesn't stand for the farrier, as many sentences we could have. And there might be something that you think of right away when I'm speaking, that you say, my horse does this. So they're acting out. So the question to you right away would be, how do you want your horse to share with you when something's not right? Just think about that. How would you want it? Because so many people will say, my horse acted out. So how do you want him to say? because he can not necessarily speak verbally like we do, so how do we expect them to express it? See, when everything's copacetic, they're going to be nice, and it's a harmonious situation. But if they're in pain, they've got to show you somehow. If they're concerned, got to show you somehow. And although you're seeing some of these Reiki demonstrations and so on, this is pretty scientific. The horses have the same emotions as we do. That part of their brain is the same as ours. So why would we not think that they can have that emotion of grief, sadness, concern, worry, fear? Rightfully so, when we train horses, we will say they're in the now, they're in the moment. And it's true. So if you see the round pen demo, Biscuit was with me. She's in the now. So training purposes, they're with you in the now. And yet at the same time, if you've just weaned a baby from that mare, she can grieve. Maybe we'll keep her occupied when we're training her, but ultimately when she goes back, she could continue grieving. So they have this ability to have the emotion and their expression would be through facial expressions or acting out. So I've had a great day today exploring my creative part and really enjoying it with the audience interaction. So my first question would be, how many people are wearing belts today, if you can raise your hand? Awesome, love it. You have a choice, you can participate or not. I'd love for you to stand up and tighten them by one to two holes and sit back down. <laughs> can you do that? Whoever doesn't want to do it, great, but everybody else, one, if not two, holes, and sit back down. Let's see how long you last. Okay? I've got some people literally going, oh. <laughs> Others are laughing, going, I know where she's heading with this. I've never done this before. I had to be restrained in my thoughts this morning at 3 a.m. because I had a lot of ideas. <laughs> okay. So how are we feeling with tying belts? <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep it like that. We've got less comfortable, anxious. We're going to keep it like this. And if you, if you really feel sick after a while, by all means, do uh, loosen them. So I don't, don't really need you that poorly. The point of it, people will say, you can't tighten that girth too tight. I've been in places there. I am one that does tight girths because I st cut, start colts for a living. So when you put a saddle on a young horse for the first time, it has to be tight. For me, the treeless don't work so well because the treeless may not stay in place without the withers. So it could roll, and that's a disaster for a horse. So we're tight in the saddle tight. And I usually have starter saddles that's like a racehorse saddle. So there's a reason to go a little tighter there. But if you think about how you tighten the girth, and every location's different. So some of the dude ranches, you can get that whole hand in between the horse and the girth. Leaves me a little uneasy when I'm riding, because I like it to be tighter with maybe a finger or two. And everybody will gauge that girth differently. But there's times where it will cut into the muscle of the horse, and it could do long-term damage. So think about that. How would that horse express it? 
that that girth is too tight. Somebody may say, my horse is bucking for no reason. If the trainer's not diligent, he could come back with, ride him through it. Keep that head up, ride him through it. Don't let him get away with it, common words. But what if you've missed the fact that the girth's simply too tight and he can't expand his rib cage? How is he supposed to tell you? The shout is the bucking. That's clear for all of us. Horse is now bucking. There's the expression. But let's go backwards. Let's say the first time it happens, he could think that this is just a one-time thing. The second time it happens, behavior starts to come in. What kind of behavior would your horse show you that the saddle doesn't fit? Share it. He would? Not standing still for saddling. What else? Might nip. Exactly, might nip towards the side. What else? Could kick at you. Lay, lay down's extreme, but yeah. So they could display it in any which way. Now all the ways you guys have said would be when the saddle's approaching, okay? So let's put that in the conversation. The shout is the bucking, the conversation would be the nipping at the side. Let's go further back. What would be your whisper that something's wrong, potentially? Absolutely. Not wanting to be caught. So the whisper is that horse looks at you and says, not today. And you'll go, what's up here? They don't want to be caught. They're trying to say the association is the saddle's coming next. It goes all the way back to there. But we wait till we get the bucking. And oftentimes, we'll come back with ride them through. So what we're looking at with this girth in your belt would be how would you act out? If I were to now say, and I may just say it, for all my people that have tightened their belt, why don't you take a lap or two around the chairs? <laughs> and I, love, I love the laughing, actually. Should we rephrase it? Let's take a lap or two around the chairs. Oh, so we went from laughing to quiet, and I went from senior smiles to, she's serious. If I did it a third time and probably said, let's run around the chairs, let's try it, you'd wonder, is she going to go that far? Hypothetically then, let's say you did. Some of you are going to slow down. Some of you aren't getting out of your chairs anyway. Some of you are going to slow down and go, that's not going to cut it for me. Some might get upset with me. Some could just phase out, ignore me. So it's going to come out many different ways that you're going to say, I can't run with this belt because my focus is here. It's not comfy. What do we do? We kick him on, spur him on, use a whip, and go, he's being lazy today or he's not with it. We may not realize where it's come from. So we're looking at this to realize the acting out is communication. It's not, generally speaking, remember we're going off this topic, generally speaking, it's not that they're being naughty or rude, there's usually a reason. So if you wish to change your belt back to what you had, by all means change it back so you're not sitting here in discomfort this whole time. I'd like some other volunteers. Fresh socks, by the way, brand new socks. <laughs> Who has tight shoes on as it is? Fairly tight boots or shoes. Anybody? I need at least three of you. You're all quiet now. <laughs> Love you to volunteer to put the second pair of socks on. Who has tight boots but thinks they could get their foot in with a second pair? Perfect. Because often we learn best not from a lecture, but actually experiencing it. How can we understand how they feel when we're not willing to go there? So if we have a pair of shoes that sort of fit, but might be a little tight, and we put a beautiful pair of socks on and put the foot in, how would that compare for our horses? Where are we going with this piece? Being shod, yep. That's exactly it. We're going for the shoes. Nothing wrong if you've got a great fire and you need shoes, if you're living in a rocky area. At the White Stallion Ranch in Arizona, the horses have shoes on, because believe it or not, it's not just sandy desert, there's rocks. They need shoes. They're going out every day. It makes sense. 
So I'm not anti-shoes. However, there's also something to be said with natural hoof care, easy boots, etc. And there's a realization to have it that that foot, foot may not be able to expand on certain shoes, right? So if you overdo it, that foot's gonna get restricted. Think about that. How many of us think or rely purely on that farrier that maybe we haven't had it checked? How does it feel for your horse? So those that have got the extra socks on in their shoes, would you care to walk around? Just walk around. Because you think of it, because there's... <laughs> she's perfect. She was a perfect candidate. You can see her tentatively walking around. <laughs> I love it. Remember, these are socks. These aren't even metal things that will ricochet off the ground. These are socks. I've gone for soft. I didn't, I didn't go with my husband's suggestions of putting little rocks in your shoes. <laughs> We went for socks, and she looks fabulous. She's tentative. And they, actually, they all are. They're walking very strangely. Yes, and this is with compassion. So we're doing this with compassion. We're not in here going, get moving, don't care what you have to say. We're doing it with a lot of compassion. And we've got a sock which is soft. It's not hard. So we think about that to realize what's going on with that horse to realize the only communication they have is to show you. They have to show you through their actions because they don't have any other option. It's a silent communication. And it may be that they just are not forward at that point and you're exploring things. You're coming back with, what could this be? Allow me to think about that. Instead of just defaulting to the fact that they're being obnoxious, we default to the fact of what could this be? How can I help you? And that's the example with the socks. We're going to keep the examples coming. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're up in it. All right. <laughs> I love your reactions. We're up in it. I even chose a very pretty one and a little bit different. So um, I've seen an awful lot of these being used this weekend. Great if they're an aid, nothing wrong with that if you're riding dressage and you're going to tap for an aid and create a bit of collection or cue to a way that the horse understands it. I think you laughed the loudest. Well, I said, oh no. <laughs> Would you care to join me? Oh boy. Okay. Now I get real red <laughs> I'm good. So my idea is not to embarrass anybody, right? The idea is to be educational here. So. He's not set up, he doesn't actually know what I'm gonna do, he can only assume. And he doesn't know what's expected from him. Neither do any of you, because I haven't prepped this. See what he does with it. <laughs> now I could keep going, let's pause for a minute. How do you feel about that? Let's go for a feeling. I paused early. How do you feel about uh, it? Being antagonized. Being antagonized. Okay. He said I might go red, so I could be embarrassed. We're going to keep going because you haven't figured out. I'm actually asking something very specific. I know exactly what I'm asking. He has to figure it out. So what is it? Um, okay. <laughs> so now I'll do what some of you see. Bear with me. Don't get too angry. Okay. Ouch! Oh. I upped it. Oops. Okay. All right. So we up it, don't we? And you're going to have to figure it out. What do you think I'm asking? Lift a foot. What else? For him to go. Anything else? It's in your mind. I have no idea. Okay. So when we tap a horse, what is their nature to do? What's the nature? The nature? Hmm? Into Correct. He assumed it was move away because he might have seen it, or he's a human and he's going to move away. I went for the opposite. The nature of the horse when they feel pressure is to lean in. I wanted him to lean in. He had no clue, just like the horse has no clue when you're tapping what it means. 
In their nature, when you press on something, their nature is to lean back. They're into pressure by nature. That horse has no clue it means walk away. And yet what do we do? We tap harder and harder, and we say, as long as it doesn't leave a welter otherwise, it's okay. It's not okay, it's called abuse. So in his case, he came back with, I feel a little embarrassed, I feel a little anxious, now I'm getting frustrated, and when I upped it and took my risk, he went, hey, the energy changed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We could pull any of you out, and I could teach you something else with this without telling you. Realize it's against the nature of the horse. They have no clue. They have no clue what you're saying. So it's not okay to go like this and not communicate with them. It's different if you were back at 45 in the driving zone, maybe indicating through your body language that I'm looking for you to yield, and I create this as an aid. Different, because now I'm connecting, communicating, and bringing in the language that they understand and opting to go over to a cue. Nothing wrong with that. I'll teach him the cue. Instead of just going, I'm going to keep doing the same thing until you figure it out, but I'm not going to tell you what you need to figure out. I'm going to let you work it out. But your emotions aren't allowed to come up. You're not allowed to get frustrated because I'll hit you more if you do. That's what this can do. So how's that horse meant to tell you he's embarrassed, upset, frustrated, concerned if he's not allowed to pin his ears or he's not allowed to cow kick at you. How's he meant to tell you he doesn't know what this means? You have to start thinking about the responses to realize what can I do differently to help my horse? Because we're all on the same page, we're all on the same team. It's not a win or lose. Win or lose means you're there and I'm here. There's no team on winning and losing. There's only a team when we're on the same page and then there's no winning and losing full stop. So we constantly want to look at how can this horse be helped? What can we do to improve ourselves so that they have a greater understanding of what's expected from them? So their language is a silent language made up from three components. One would be visualization. They pick up on your thoughts. If your thought has an emotion attached to it, positive emotion, it will get across to them with great ease. So at first you would visualize it because that's their basic form. It's like a V. They have a basic form of communication which would be the visualization. They can pick up on that, your intention. Your energy definitely makes a difference. And so when I was tapping him on the side, I had a little emotion. Now let's talk about that emotion for a minute because this has come to my attention recently. What kind of emotion would you want with horse training? What kind of emotion are you seeking? And what's acceptable and not acceptable that the horse can process? Think about that. So let's say you're teaching him to yield. You've got this and you're teaching him to yield as an aid. What emotion would you want to carry? Dominant. You'd want to be dominant. Okay. I can do that. Okay, what else? Let's go with neutral. Neutral. Interesting. Okay. What's that, back there? Very calm and positive. Very good, calm and positive. Dancing and harmony. Dancing and harmony. What understanding? Understanding, perfect. Okay, there's more people wanting to speak. Positive. Confident, yeah. Partnership. Partnership, fantastic words coming out here. So what do horses seek in us? A lot of what you've just said. They seek the partnership. And you would question what does partnership look like for them and you? So let's look at what they see as it. So we have to go back to wild horses at that point, to nature. And you begin to look at what does a true leader look like out there in nature, in the wild. So if you look at um, Sand Cliff, Sand Basin here, you can go to Wyoming, the McCullough Peaks, you can go to the Prior Mountains. We've got wild horses, 28,000-ish here in the United States, 50,000 in holding pens. But we start to look at the wild horses and the best character trait for a leader would be awareness. Not dominance, awareness. If you look at the majority of the wild horses leading, the leader has awareness. So it comes back to us. So when I've got the Arabian here this morning in my round pen, I'm not going to scold him for awareness. 
He carried his head up high to be aware. It's part of his character, so I'm not going to scold him for that. I'm going to notice he's aware, and I'm going to be, hopefully, equally as aware. Why we do that, we want to take that character trait with us to say, if you need your leader to be aware, would you, as a human, not carry your head up high? So you may then say, my horse steps on my foot regularly. Do you know why? It's not out of disrespect. Generally speaking, it's because you lack awareness. You're in your head. You're so in your head that you didn't notice he's stepping sideways. So the lesson isn't more respect. The lesson is be aware you're claiming a leader. Be a leader. Keep your head up. Notice the footfall. Get out the way and be aware. You want to lead, you have to earn it. It's not given to you. So think of that in your true life situation if you're employed by somebody. Do you trust the person who doesn't have your back? Do you trust the person who's not leading correctly? How many of you will comment about your boss that doesn't even know what you're doing and then you go, I'm running the company and she doesn't even know? You don't have respect for them. You have respect for somebody that has your back that is taking care of you. So the horses are seeking that awareness. They're seeking the trust. They need the trust. They need the trust because they're herbivores. They're flight animals. So the awareness would be, if you look at the wild horses, the awareness is the movement or the color out there. They need to know when the mountain lion's coming. My horse Excalibur, his father lived in Wyoming, four and a half thousand acres, on the Oshoto Ranch in Wyoming. Excalibur's a Spanish Mustang. His father's a lead Mustang and his mother's a lead mare. So he's got lead blood with three calyx on his forehead. Highly complex, complicated, intelligent beyond belief, and on top of it, a mustang. So that means he's so aware. So you ride my horse, he's going to poke you and look for your little holes to go, is it worth you leading? Can I trust you to lead? Because if you walk down there, he's probably going to actually pick you up and walk off with you. Now, me as an instructor, I'm going to talk to you, not my horse, and I'm going to say, why did he pick you up and walk off with you? Because he will. You'll say, he's being disrespectful, I'll back him up. I will say, you didn't have sufficient awareness for my horse. Get more aware, get more actively involved, and when he trusts and respects you, he won't do that. So improve who you are. He's not acting out, you're not leading. So you start to come back with, what is trust? Trust for them would be that they feel comfortable. They feel like you are aware. They feel like you are present. They feel like they can trust you, i.e. back up where they can't see or come forward. They feel like they're just not being used. You know, they're not just behind you and they're a tool, they're a partner. You mentioned the partnership. We've taken away their liberty anyway because we've put them into captivity. So the partnership would mean that we, they rely on us and we provide not just the biological needs but other needs for the characters too. So when we look at the acting out piece in a partnership, we start to look at what can we change to bring them back to nature as close as possible. So the glory of traveling, I get to see a lot. I've worked with a ton of racehorses, a ton of performance horses. In fact, I went to Spain one year and uh, we were looking for demonstration horses out there and I flew into Spain and the round pen hadn't been built yet. They were still doing it and throwing out the stones to make sure it was safe. The horses hadn't been selected. So they asked me to go out in a car and start looking around for horses. And they took me to a, a bullfighting herd of horses. They were all being raised for bullfighting. Out of respect for the country and the people, I'm going to show the respect. At least I'm there and I'm respectful. I walked through the aisle, it wasn't a match. It's not a match because I'm gonna communicate and connect with these horses. My job was to start them under saddle. What I'm saying to them is, open your heart, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna connect and communicate in a language you already know. And I'm going to provide equal partnership. Imagine doing that for one hour of their life and then handing them over to bullfighting. I couldn't do it. 
So I said, the horses aren't suitable for what I'm looking for, because I felt like I'm going to open the heart and then shred it for them. When I was there, I walked through the aisleway, and you've got to imagine these mad majestic individuals running towards the bars, ear pinning, kicking out unhappy horses. You're going to look at them and call them warriors and athletes, and they are. They've got a phenomenal job that they're doing, and they're exceedingly brave, unhappy all the same. So we start looking at the vices that come out of this from the racehorse, 23 hours in a stall when horses roam 23 hours. They're being fed twice a day when horses are trickle feeders and eat 18 hours. They are isolated and not socialized when horses have a herd environment. We're asking them to become athletes at 18 months old when they're not even fully developed. They go into training and are started under saddle. You see them wind sucking, box walking. You see them striking with their ears pinned because these were youths at 18 months old, mentally not mature, asking to become an athlete. It's a lot to ask, so they get vices. And the vices could be the weaving, could be the wind sucking. We don't see that in nature. They don't do that. You don't see them cribbing on wood and sucking air. They don't do that because they're free. So that acting out gets established. And what comes first, you know, the cart or the horse? We've now got pain involved too. So a lot of horses that are wind sucking will have ulcers. A lot of performance horses, brood mares, foals who have been weaned will have ulcers. Records state that 80% of them will have ulcers. So brood mares, foals, performance horses. With ulcers comes a lot of the time wind sucking because they're, they're getting that urge and that, um, that addiction to support the gut. So what do you do? You know, do you give them then clay and probiotics and fix the gut? It's come from a mental state. We have to fix the mental piece in order to support the gut. So instead of just looking at that two-year-old thoroughbred and saying he's a handful and he's just come off the track, he's not a handful, they get a bad rap. He was never trained to go on a trail. He was trained to go in a circle, usually counterclockwise, and he was trained to walk, trot, canter without a left or right, usually just the left lead. So it's not that the thoroughbred is a difficult horse, it's the fact that that child, that two-year-old horse, was never shown, anything, never shown anything other than what he had. And then at four or five, he's more of an adult with zero or little knowledge. So instead of us saying that thoroughbred is dangerous or acting out, and you look at great organizations like Cantor supporting them to rehab them, we don't say they're acting out. We look at how can we help? How can we help you? So how can we help? We look at that. The first thing I would say is return everything as close to nature as possible. How can we bring them back to natural? If they're cooped up in stools and it looks like a jail to you, you'd be right. Again, it's not anthropomorphism. It's fact. They roam free on hundreds of acres, 100,000 acres for the McCullough Peaks for 100 head of horses. 100,000 acres they roam on. So we need to get them out moving. If they usually graze, and we're cutting it down to two hours of alfalfa, common in California, less common here, we're feeding them protein, and they're stuck in a stool. We need to let them roam. We need to trickle feed them, give them something more productive like Timothy Hay. Back to nature. So everything you can think of, these are only two things. We come back to more things. Now, when you look at the round penning, I didn't take it to the point where we did the vulnerable areas and feet, but you also begin to realize that everything we ask is against the nature of the horse. Picking up feet, it's their form of defense, their only form. They want to run. If you take away the flight, you have fight. They want to run. You're picking up a foot. Hugely trust building. I got fired by one of my farriers, actually, recently. 
and it was an interesting, actually a lot of you have met Aria, it was an interesting incident because my horses are really good. I deal with problem horses. I get employed to deal with severe kickers and biters for the farrier. My job is to prepare them. Wild horses, foals, you name it, we've had them all. My horses are fine. Here's your issue. You give a horse a voice, they're going to speak. You no longer have a compliant robot or otherwise you have a horse that's connecting and communicating. And my horses will read the farrier. And he came in and a nice guy, everything, and he passed the Excalibur test, that was good. But Aria has one way that she likes, and you do this for her, she'll be fine. Her thing is, say hi. So she likes, so she's standing here, reach out, say hi, pick up any foot. He didn't. He focused in on the foot, picked it up, and the hind, all she did was move. He did again, she moved. The third time he looked up and he said, you're not gonna score this horse? And I went, no. So now he, the energy shifted between us and he said, you're not gonna score the horse. And I said, she hasn't done anything wrong. He comes back with, well, she's moving, she's being disrespectful. I said, you never said hi to her. And he's probably thinking, she's this woo-woo blonde chick. He's now going, say hi to my horse. <laughs> You know, I'm coming back, back with just be in partnership and be respectful. Isn't this about mutual respect? And instead of grabbing somebody's foot without saying hi, wouldn't you at least say, hi, Aria, may I take your foot? No. So he severed the relationship. And it's not easy to get a farrier, so it's not like I wanted that to happen, but it wasn't a fit because I'm not going to school my horse if it's not her fault. Now, if it was her fault, and if she's anything like she was here, we'll school her to say, stay focused, be respectful, get out of his face. Absolutely. But here's where we are responsible for them. You are the legal guardians. You know them best. You give them the voice, expect them to speak, but also stand up for them because as a professional too, I go in everywhere. My job is to fix them, right? I'm employed to fix. And usually I have three days max to fix a horse. That means three days to save a life. So that for me is assessing this animal, assessing the horse. I'll do it at liberty for sure. Let me see your movement. If you're sound, you're lame. I cannot diagnose, but I can see as a professional if they're sound or lame. I may look at the nutrition, the lifestyle, the environment and the training. So we're looking at all of that, some of which can, that can be coming out in the round pen that they show you through behavior. So my job is to assess. So I can do that through watching them. If there's pain, this is a big one. If there's pain, we have to stop there and then. You guys have the extra shoes on, you felt the whip, we had the belt tightening. I cannot modify your behavior if you're in pain. I simply can't do that because you've got to show me there's pain and you can't change your behavior because there's pain, you can't override it. So if we look at a high percentage, let's say it's about 80% of pain, acting out is pain. We eliminate the pain, now we can deal with the mind. So the pain can include teeth. You'd be surprised how many people don't know that horses need their teeth floating. Not last year, the year before, there were three deaths at clinics where, where the horse came to the clinic and then died shortly after, not because of my clinic, but they've had power tools with dentistry. I'm not against power tools, it's the hands that hold the equipment. And yet these three dentists in three different countries had utilized it inappropriately, taking off the tooth, the horse was, was starving to death not blaming dentists, I am blaming the fact that it was inappropriately done. That horse, one was a therapy horse, couldn't do his job anymore and they discarded him and he went to slaughter. He was in Germany and he went to slaughter. He wasn't acting out, he couldn't eat. He was in pain. It may be chiropractic that you're looking at. I don't know if any of you love the chiropractor, I fall in love with them, I get regular adjustments. I know that if my pelvis is slightly tilted, it's about to come out and I usually feel the twinge here. And if it comes out, it's bloody painful. I also know I'm not as effective. Your horses have the same things. They were never designed, never created to be ridden. Suddenly we're riding them. So you have an athlete at home and nearly everybody at the horse expo has athletes. We need to take care of them chiropractically. 
if their back is out or they're short on the hind, they're going to show you. They're not going to be able to tuck under or take that lead, etc. So the chiropractor is important equally as much as a massage therapist because the, the muscle will support that structure. So you could look at when does the massage therapist come in versus the chiropractor. I mistakenly thought all those years ago that when I started my Mustangs under saddle, they wouldn't need chiropractic. I'm thinking they've been out in the wild, they'll be fine. It was a mistake, I learned from it. And playing can cause it just as much as training. So we ask anybody that's bringing their colts to the colt starting clinic to get a chiropractic adjustment first. Here's why. Honeybrook, one of my mares, she's now six. I gentled her when she was three months old. She's a Premarin. That means that her mother stands on the P line, pregnant mare's urine, and she's the byproduct of Premarin, hormone replacement therapy. She was destined for slaughter, and each year we do rescues. And Honey was brought in. She's on the DVD, falls in training. She's beautiful. She's a buckskin. And a number of years ago, I watched her grow up. We did the, the foal training, and she came onto the holistic horse course, the certification. She did beautifully. And Vin, my husband, who you met briefly, he's been through the program because he's, he's a city slicker. He's from Manhattan. So he went through the program. He's now a rancher, so it's all good. And he followed the methods. But every course Vin's been on, he's brought a horse home. So my, that's the challenge. I banned him from the last one here in Centennial, and he still managed to do it. I literally said, you don't need to come to the fold gently. And so I said, come to the graduation at the end, just so you see all the folds graduate. And he missed the fold graduation. So he's there in the circle where we're closing. And there were 12 folds, two with mares, 12. And ultimately, 10 had been adopted. One was going out in the pasture and field. 10 had been adopted by students. Then literally, hears the closing words and says, we can't leave one behind. I come back with, he's at the rescue, is fine. No, we're not leaving one behind. So the students are going, yeah, yeah, I'm not taking I totally blank them and ignore them. They're going, I'm not taking another one because Vin's taken so many. He goes to dinner that night going, we're taking Sabre, we can't leave him behind. Next morning, he picks him up. It started with Honeybrook. He was on the two-week course, Honeybrook's coming home. It continued with Aria, with Hermes, with Sabre, and he sort of had an influence on Sage. It continues. So our herd has grown. I only ever needed one horse. We have nine. <laughs> so he's got a heart as big as the United States. So with Honeybrook, what happened after Vin fell in love he said, I'd like to take this horse home. And it spurred somebody else on to say, I'm going to adopt her. So I thought, OK. And I did advise the rescue and shared with them, green and green can make black and blue. You've got a novice with a young foal. They said, we'll train her up. So they did everything they could. We'll train her. We'll support her. I saw Honeybrook a couple of years after that. And um, she wanted to be on this press thing. So we was being interviewed, cameras there, and she kept on hanging out. And I'm thinking, this is interesting. And I remember saying to her, and I've changed my words since, if you wish to come home with us, manifest it. I've changed wording since. <laughs> Just so we know. What happened, I got a phone call a little while later. And a be the beautiful young lady, and she said, I've read all the books on cult starting, and I watched all the DVDs. It was the fifth ride. It's often the fifth ride. But you don't know that because it's not in the books. You do if you start colts. She said, on the fifth ride, Honeybrook bucked. I fell off and broke my back in five places. Not, you know, a little sad story. And she's totally fine, but she did break her back. And she said, I will keep her for life, but I can see that she wants to be with you. We said, absolutely, she can come on home. So we brought her home. And those were the days now that I've changed my wording for all my clients, that if, I, if you have a horse, say, manifest it gently. Manifest it gently. <laughs> so they understand we don't need to be dramatic. Manifest it gently. So she came home. We're coming back to the chiropractic, please. She's the one I've started slowest under saddle. 
Usually speaking, in seven days, we have them under saddle with a rider on, be it belling over, first ride, third ride, usually. And with Honey, I took a lot of time. I took a, a year to really let her have some respite, start over, fill in gaps. Took her to the chiropractor, wonderful chiropractor here in Colorado. And she said her sternum was out. Any horse with a sternum out would have bucked, was what she stated. She was checked, the sternum stayed in after that. We didn't restart her with a new saddle, biggest experience of their life, and a sternum out would be a traumatic experience with a huge memory. We fixed the sternum so that she could have a better chance with the saddle. So this is huge because you could see, and we are in cowboy country, and you need a good cowboy on at times to be able to ride out that buck, absolutely. If it just comes and you couldn't read it happening, because that can happen, you need that. But at the same time, we don't need to ride out a buck where there's pain involved. We need the pain fixed pre so that we don't have the association of pain, saddle, and riding. This is the acting out. So what we can do as humans, we can have their back, which is check the feet, check the saddle, check the teeth, check all of that, and then we start looking at rider error. Because once we've eliminated the pain, and then the horses are acting out, we look, we look at us. So is it conflicting messages? Is it clarity? Too much leg? Is it this, that? We can go through that full list of take our responsibility. What have, what have we done? But it's really neat to look at this acting out to say, let's look at the pain in our list. Let's look at us before we look at them to come back with it's them. Because they have to show us one way or another how they are feeling. We've looked a little bit there at pain, and naturally the emotions play a part too. If you look at Aria yesterday, the emotion was she's away from home, Excalibur's calling, it's not physical. She wasn't acting out because of physical. It was a lot of stuff, a lot of stimulus away from home. People may have walked away from that demo saying, you know, she was difficult or the, the demo wasn't good, I'm not sure, some, many, walked up to us to say how powerful it was because they could take something valuable home. At no point did we blame her. What we did was adjust the session to come back with, she's finding it difficult to be driven in an arena. She's done it many times. How can we help her? We're not going to reprimand her so she feels even worse about herself. We're actually gonna say, how can we help? Let's click <coughs> on with a lead rope, make it easier so she doesn't feel so alone or upset. And then we can put her back in a place of safety, i.e. the round pen, to say, let's get some of that energy out so that you and your person feel safe together. And we look for some tries. We look for some good things. So you think of your life, and often people think of school, and they look back, and if they had trouble at school, be it that you had what's entitled ADD or otherwise, you look at the time, how were you treated? You know, was it a good experience, a negative experience? Were you supported? Were you ridiculed? I hear horrible stories where children are asked to stand in the corner, facing the corner, and it sticks with them for life. That they get shy, they become introverted, they feel like they cannot be seen. They even change their whole life path with what somebody said to them when they were little. You may be one of these people. So the words have huge power one time maybe in your life, and it stuck with you. Naturally, you have the choice to hold on to that or let it go, but we don't always know how to do that. So realize this with the horses too. Your one bad day where you overdo it could either get released by them because they have that ability, or they're gonna hold on to that too. They have a memory for life, understand that. That's a huge piece. Their memories for life, when people say, does my horse recognize me after 20, 30 years? They're not gonna show you the same way as you would show, like a hug and yay, great to see you after 20 years. They may just go, hmm, and walk off. So it's a little different. 
they make sure they're but I went to France and my horses in France carry and after 10 years I went and I'm all excited and nervous to see her and uh, she literally did that and walked off and then I'm thinking oh that wasn't very kind I thought I'd get a better hello then she backs up to me and she just says scratch my bum and I'm thinking 20 years you know 10 20 years and you're going scratch my bum so I did and then she walked off and you go, oh great, nice to see you too. Glad I could serve you today. No hard feelings. So it's a slightly different way to express. It's not our way. But the key is that they have the memory for life. And in my experience, it goes pre-birth. It's an interesting concept. The Premarin horses, because in those days, they were like 2,000 on one farm. They couldn't get them ready for the farrier. So they would put them in a chute, put them on a table, that means a squeeze, and turn the table and trim the feet. Or they would squeeze them and rope the foot and trim it, common nowadays. <clears throat> because you've got 2,000 horses, can't train them all up, it's the easiest way to treat them like cattle. What we found, this is a little while ago, what we found was the babies that hit the ground had trauma around the feet. How do I know that? Because I gentle wild horses for a living and they don't have trauma. You can pick up a hind foot fairly easily with a rope and so on. There's not a memory. The Premarin foals at that time, not all of them currently, at that time would have trauma around it. And you'd think, how's that possible? And if anybody's ever given birth to a human child, you would look at the pregnancy to see how that pregnancy affected your child. Why would we think it's any different when it comes to a horse? But we do. We do. We think it's different. And we expect it to be different. So the more you can have that open mind to realize this is not personal, they don't hate you, and they're not trying to make your day horrible, they're trying to communicate in the only way they know how. Some less, more subtle, some more severe. I could give you probably a thousand more stories because of all the horses that I've dealt with, but suffice to say, we're getting there. I want to throw one piece in before we wind this down. We're going to go esoteric, which is always fascinating. Here's the piece with that. We've talked about pain. We've talked about emotions. We haven't talked about the spiritual connection. For those people that understand soul's contracts and soul's purposes, you will never be given a horse that you cannot handle. There are no such things as coincidences. That horse is in your life for a reason. When the student is ready, the master will appear. So are the horses. So when you have that one horse, and you see it quite a bit, where the person says, I've been waiting for this dream horse. I've never been able to have them, and now I'm in my 40s, and I've got this horse that's challenging me. Interesting. No such thing as coincidences. It means that they are here to teach you something. This is not in the books where you say, is it the feet, is it the teeth, is it the saddle, is it the back? This goes way beyond it. This goes to this place where you are ready for a life lesson. That's what it means. They are here to teach you a life lesson. It changes everything. They're here to challenge your beliefs. They're here to teach you. And we're not talking about teaching where you're learning balance or you're learning left, right, forward, slow, stop. We're talking about a life lesson. Maybe they're teaching you to love. Maybe you're going to lose a horse early on. I lost one at nine months old. The day I said I'm going to adopt him and take him home is the day he died in my arms. So we have this life lesson to realize it's here to make us stronger or here to teach us something. Excalibur surely is. Like, you know, if you guys saw me, I love that Frisian long lining. Take him home in a heartbeat. And there's a little poor me going on for sure because I look at all my clients and students and go, oh, you've got that schoolmaster. Unconditional love that says, here's my back, ride me, I'll take care of you today. None of my horses do that. <laughs> I bring Excalibur to the expo, don't know what the hell I'm signing out for. If I overdo any of my lessons, he hates them. So I never prep him. I come here, he's not had the parachute on in one year, and I have to do it that way in my opinion because it keeps him engaged. And then you visualize something and he keeps you to the letter 
And if you move it, he'll make sure you committed to that. Two laps of canter and I'm gonna stop. And he loves to show off, so he'd canter with the parachute with his head up high towards the camera, and then he'd go, it's all done, I'm done. And he challenges every single method I have. Doesn't like the TLC, the long lining, everything, you know? So it's all the stuff I teach. He challenges me. He's the one that taught me food as reward. He's the one that teaches intuitive riding, i.e. how to ride with your mind. He teaches all of that because nothing else I've done worked because <laughs> he gets obnoxious and bored. So he took me out of the comfort zone. So when I ride him, I have to be so present, so deliberate, so clear, and he'll challenge me. And I look at the Frisian and go, I wish I had you in my life too. You know, I wouldn't mind that schoolmaster on times that you just take out and go, let's have a great time. With my horses, you just don't know what you're going to get. So you look at that one to realize they're here to teach you a life lesson. Be that unconditional love that you learn love. Be it that you're so guarded you don't know how to love anymore. It's worth the risk, right? It's better to have loved than to never loved at all. They may be here to teach you that. They may be here to teach you that dominance is not the answer. Why would we use the stick until you figure it out? Why wouldn't we say, he stood up, he was brave, he's trying really hard to figure it out, let me help him figure it out, instead of see him getting upset, hurt and frustrated, because I'm on his team and I want him to succeed. Maybe dominance isn't the answer. So we start to look at these words that we use, trust, respect, leadership, and we start to change where we once were, which could be dominance-based, and we move into true leadership, which is what the horses do, which is passive leadership. You don't see the majority of the horses beating each other up. They don't. They lead by their being, by their presence. They don't lead by bullying and manipulation. So we begin to evolve as horsemen and women to realize if we're on the team, we're rooting for each other, not against each other. We both need a voice. We both need an opportunity to go forward and move into it. We both need to realize that they're trying really hard, whatever hard is for this day. Because you think of that, I'll tell you this morning with the clocks changing, I was probably grouchy at best and had my coffee luckily nearby. You could look at that and say, is she giving her best? I'm giving my best for the fact that I had a few hours sleep. Um, I get kicked in the chest and the head by my three-year-old throughout the night. My 14 and a half year old dog checks in because he's deaf to make sure that I'm in the bed still. So he wakes me up multiple times. The clocks have gone forward. I walk into that round pen giving my best. What I don't need would be people heckling me, right? That would be the same with you guys. The horses, you don't know what happened to them in the last 24 hours. They're giving their best all the time, their best for that moment. And more understanding and compassion that you can have, the more you've got the partnership, the trust, respect, and true leadership. Okay? So there is my speech for today. I thank you so much for your undivided attention. Thank you.